Now it's Peter's Peter's turn to be put under the uh, microscope. I uh, thought it's only fair that um, my collaborator in crime is interviewed as well. Uh, just due to practical concerns, the pieces uh, that Peter has produced for Sideband's CD Medets aren't going to be included in our in our streaming event, but I'd like to uh, ask some questions. I wanted to just start off by text, asking to speak to text. You've I've played quite a number of your pieces, and I'm I know your your output pretty well. And there's an ongoing career-long interest in using text, um, and there are certain themes, largely history, Australian history, amongst others, that that come through again and again. So I was just wondering. Yeah, why the for you the the emphasis on using text as one of the main sort of streams of your output and your interest in history and those types of themes? Uh, yeah, well, I've always had an interest in history going right back to high school. I, uh, I I did as many history subjects as I could: ancient history, modern history, you know, wh whatever I could do. But I was particularly interested in in modern history. Uh, and particularly World War Two, and that's the uh, really the interest behind uh, you know the the main composition that's uh, that's on the uh, on the album of of mine, which is Voice of the Depths. Mm. So the the background of you know that particular composition uh, is that it, it uses some fragments of letters written by a um, uh, a member of the uh, of the crew of the Royal Australian Navy ship, the HMAS Canberra. The other interesting link with this particular mm. crew member, uh, mm. called Russell Keats, is that his father was the Australian composer Horace Keats. Uh, and also another link, uh, Russell Keats's younger brother, much younger brother actually, uh, Brandon Keats is also the co-founder of the Wirrapang publishing company who represents uh, uh, my compositions and uh, the voice that is heard mm. on the pre-recorded track for this particular work is actually the voice of, uh, of Brennan Keats. So Peter, was it different or special in some way working on this project? I don't know, did it impart some kind of custodial mindset in you, some, some, some sort of something different about the project, knowing that you were holding that quite precious legacy, if you like. Yeah, it brought a real sense of authenticity, I think, to the, uh, to the composition itself. And uh, uh, when you listen to Brennan actually uh, reading the, uh, the, the text aloud of his, uh, his, his brother's letters, Often you can hear the emotion in his voice as well, which brings another uh, another layer to the composition, I think. I watched all your birthdays go by one by one, hoping that each time that I'll be home for the next. Now mine, the last has passed, and Christmas awaits us. Yes, I'm beginning to wonder if we'd ever had Christmas together. I never dreamt we'd be away so long as this, any more than did any of the others. It is the longest trip that Kenny has ever done since the beginning of the war. The places we have been to, ships we have seen, and the things we have done as individuals don't concern anyone. <laughs> To go back to text a little more and just to re revisit your other vocal piece on this album at the melting of the snow um, so you said that your interest in history is largely modern history modern australian history and yet banjo patterson springs up so there's two elements i wanted to ask about one yeah the choice of that text and the second was another thing that i've, I've gotten to know in your work as a performer actually, which is the reworking of earlier earlier repertoire. And this was a student piece for you. So I guess I was wondering partly what it's like for you now 
you know, with a much greater command of technique and knowledge of, I guess, what works and doesn't work, or, or maybe hindsight as to the success of your previous works. What it's like engaging with the younger you and this piece, which was a much larger setting originally. Yeah, well, the choice of text was um, a, a bit more, not so much historical, but for this uh, particular text is more about the sense of uh, sense of place. So the text is about the Monaro district in the Snowy Mountains uh, area of, uh, of New South Wales. And uh, it's just a, a, a really beautiful area in the spring when the winter snows all melt and the wild wildflowers uh, reemerge, and that's essentially what the uh, what the poem the is. Launch into the poem. <laughs> yeah, it, I listened it, to that exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly, and um, that was more the interest with that particular text rather than anything sort of more historical. Uh, and uh, Patterson's also a, a, an extremely famous Australian poet, of course, probably our most famous. I can't think of anyone else more more so. Uh, and uh, I, I also wanted to use a literary work of his that probably was uh, a, you know not quite so well known and I think this one fits the bill uh, in terms of you know revising works well as you mentioned this particular work was a student piece and it was written for a much larger ensemble and really it was about with this arrangement really stripping it back to what was absolutely you know kind of needed mm -hmm. um, and getting rid of the uh, I, I guess the, the parts that really didn't necessarily need to be there, uh, but also slightly uh, a more practical concern as well. I mean, it's much easier to put on a, a, a piece for three instruments than it is for you know uh, six instruments, which is what it originally was. Mm. Well, certainly a great pleasure to play. Um, it works very nicely and brings out the spirit of the poetry. And specifically the fixed media form, like, you know, what might traditionally be called instrument and tape, for example. Um, yeah, so I, I guess your interest in why, why your interest in the more fixed form of electronic, electronic media, and there's a real sort of expressive drive behind the works too, which, you know, needn't necessarily be present in them, but, but it is, it's, it's quite an interesting area of um, work for you. The idea of working with, you know, a fixed electronic component has always been an interest for me, even going back to uh, university days. And uh, I've also always had an interest in live electronics in a bit more of a general sense. And uh, often the perception is that, you know, uh, this kind of medium or a mixed medium with uh, something that's, uh, that's pre-recorded electronically and an live instrument is always going to be quite rigid and I wanted to challenge that in some respect and you can certainly build in you know within that medium you know some uh, some scope uh, in order for a uh, performer to fit something within a, a specific period of time uh, that's something much freer and it doesn't necessarily have to be something that so you mean like rigid. In the piece amplitude, for example, which is what came to mind where I might have a pattern that has to happen within, I don't know, 10 seconds, but I've got freedom to that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And uh, there's uh, examples of that in Voice of the Depths as well. There are. There are, there are <laughs> yes, where, uh, where Stephanie is, uh, is given some material and literally the score says, you know, 
freely alternate between, you know, these uh, these particular notated gestures for a period of 12 seconds or whatever it happens to be. And there's also some sections which are a little, uh, a little stricter, uh, but uh, there is something more specific notated, but the exact placement of that mm -hmm. Is, uh, is still quite free. So there's still some scope there for the performer to interpret it a little bit more freely. I like to use some of the um, sounds from the actual live instruments that are going to be in the work. So for this particular work, piano was, was particularly one of those. So there are quite a lot of processed piano sounds and the like, uh, but there are also a lot of um, synthesized uh, sounds as well, you know, using processes like uh, additive synthesis, for example. Uh, and those are often um, quite heavily filtered just depending on the circumstance, but uh, the, the, the sound of, of filtered synthesized sounds is, uh, is quite reminiscent of something you might imagine you could hear underwater, for example, and, and that's really part of the piece as well. I mean, the, the HMAS Canberra was, uh, was, tragically, uh, was tragically sunk in the Battle of uh, Savo Island at Guadalcanal. So that's the uh, another link to you know those particular sounds for the work. We've performed it live twice, I think. Once with um, Stephanie McCallum and once with another pianist who's participated in our projects, Kerry Yong. And on both occasions, I think it came across as quite a powerful work. The audience was silenced totally by the work. It's a, you know chattering, really intense, um, beautiful work. Um, 